but children learn very quickly not to cry when no one comes when they do. A whole city of kids under the city. It was mind-blowing, devastating. You know, no child should be tied to a radiator in order to control them. Good morning, everybody. Um, Natalie, um, thank you. It's great to have you here. It's an absolute pleasure, Panda. Um, can you tell me a bit about what drew you to supporting Hope and Homes and, and how it all sort of came about? Basically, I went as a very uh, curious but uh, naive student to Romania and worked in an orphanage. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected, let's put it that way. The time came when I had to leave. I didn't cry at all whilst I was there, which I was so surprised at. And then when I got home, I couldn't stop crying because I felt this massive sense of guilt because I'd effectively abandoned these children all over again. I'd gone in there, satisfied my curiosity, learned a bit, and then walked away back to my yeah. privileged life in the UK. And I got on with my life, but I never forgot about this one little girl called Morella, who particularly um, captured my heart Anyway, long story short, I decided I wanted to go back and try and find her. And I persuaded um, Channel 5 to send a camera with me. And me and him sort of went looking for Morella. And the idea was is that we would try to tell the story of a whole generation of children through one girl's eyes. Essentially, Ceausescu banned all forms of contraception. And the idea was that he was going to build this big, strong Romanian workforce. But what it meant was a whole generation of children who couldn't be looked after. And there was very well-meaning parents who actually genuinely felt like the best thing for their child was to give their child up to the state. But the awful thing was that if you didn't reclaim your child within three months, they belong to the state. So I'd quite often go to work in the morning and see adults, parents staring through the railings and trying to identify their children, but not allowed to get back with them. And once you've seen it, you really had a duty, a moral duty to act. But but anyway, I, I went back and I did find Morella, but the awful thing was we found her tied to a radiator. Oh, and cool. she's basically been starved of any kind of interaction, um, which um, robbed her of her development. So this bright bubbly toddler that I knew and connected with and fell in love with was gone. And it was replaced by a very damaged, you know, profoundly neglected child. I decided that I wanted to try and do something about it. And um, I fundraised, I just joined Formula One and I fundraised through my friends in Formula One. That's where Hope and Homes came in because I met them and they helped me see that the orphanage system, institutions are profoundly damaging. You know, yeah. no child should be tied to a radiator in order to control them. And so I thought, my God, you know, actually what I what I need to do is partner with Hope and Homes going forward and recognize and help <laughs> spread the word, if you like, yeah. Um, yeah. the institutional care in inverted commas yeah. is never the answer. Yeah. So Hope and Homes have got this Christmas um, appeal, which is seems to be focused on helping the children in Nepal. What do you think, What was? what's your message to Grapevine members in, in helping with this appeal that starts on Tuesday, 28th? I would say that what really kind of captivates me about Hope and Homes' work is that you can be part of a solution. And there's, there's a finite solution to this problem. It's an ambitious goal, but it's an achievable one. Children's upbringings need to be full of love and music and energy, noise, and whatever form a family takes. I'm not so idealistic that I assume that every kid can have a loving family. I get that, but what we can do is we can support families in order to support their own children. So I would urge anyone to read up about this and, and come on the journey with us. You know, we, we can really do something very special for children all around the world um, by supporting Hope and Homes for Children. So the, they, they've teamed up with the Big Give, um, which means that any donations made between the 28th of November and the 5th of December will be matched and therefore doubled. So 
making donations will be all the more impactful if everyone can try and make a donation of some description. It yeah, I mean, it's amazing, amazing, isn't it? When you when you consider that, I mean, that's such a, a serotonin it's, boost in itself. You go, whoa, I've just made a yeah. difference today, even with a exactly. fiber, you know, it's great. So, um, Natalie, juggling um, the world of Formula One with your charitable work, do you find the switch difficult between, you know, your role as a presenter and then your commitments to charities like Hope and Homes for Children? It's a really, really interesting question because I remember when I first looked for Morella all those years ago and then I came into the paddock, I'd literally been in the sewers um, under the city of Bucharest looking and, and shining a, a torch into the eyes of children. These little eyes were looking back oh. at me. It was a whole city of kids under the city. It was mind blowing, devastating. And then within a week, I was walking through the F1 paddock with, you know, more billionaires you can shake a stick at. And I yeah. remember ringing my mum and saying, I, I can't, I can't do this. The juxtaposition was, was too stark. I found it, you know, almost grotesque that there was this mm. incredible mm. wealth and this abject poverty. So I kind of went cap in hand and that's where Paul Hembry at Pirelli got the ball rolling for me. And then McLaren, Ferrari, they all helped me. And now we've got this beautiful home, um, which was built with the, with the love and support of Formula One friends. So the answer to your question is no, mm. I actually think it's, it's, you know, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky yeah. to, to mix with these people that can really make a difference in the world. I mean, I've seen it firsthand, the huge difference Hope and Homes are making. But I mean, could you tell us about when you see the incredible difference that these charities, well, Hope and Homes makes? One of the things that really struck me when I went out there as a, as a teenager, as a student, was how quiet the orphanage was. And I remember walking in and saying, well, there are no kids here, surely, I mean, and they said, no, there are, but children learn very quickly not to cry when no one comes when they do. Oh, so heartbreaking that, isn't it? I just was like, what? But if no one comes when you cry, then what's the point of crying? I thought, my God. And sure enough, I walked into this orphanage and there were just rows and rows of babies staring back out at me who hadn't been picked up, cuddled, fed, had their nappy changed. And this is basically happening at, at a catastrophic level, these children. Formula One community, it's, it's so diverse and dynamic. Is there potential for more collaboration between, you know, the motorsport world and charitable organisations like Open Homes? You have to find um, like-minded people within that community, of which there are many. Um, I recently set up Flackstock, which is a, a music festival um, with a focus on mental health in memory of my my late friend Caroline Flack. It was interesting because it, you know, it really just struck a chord, pardon the pun, with um, Toto Wolf, the boss of Mercedes, because he's big on mental health, as is yeah. Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. So everyone really at Mercedes genuinely care about mental health. What's the sort of simple yet impactful way that individuals can contribute to this Christmas appeal, or actually if they want to support support Hope and Homes in, in a sort of on their broader mission? Well, I think it's really important to, to learn about the problem that we have globally in terms of 8 million children. That, that, that number's just way too high, particularly when you consider, as I say, that 80% of them do have a, a relative that could look after them. So really what we need to do is is, is sort of drill right down into to what builds a strong society, which is the family unit in whatever form that takes. And if we can support those that want to support the children, then you know we're building the foundations from the bottom up in a really strong way. And we're, we're actually right a lot of wrongs in the process. So we're hopefully impacting on a socioeconomic level that's beneficial to everyone. So absolutely um, come on board with us on this journey and uh, see hopeandhomes.org, learn about what the problem is and what the potential solution is. I mean, I really am confident that 
that, that, that we can that we can change this so we can change yeah. the history and consign institutional care to the history books and let children flourish as they deserve i mean no child asks to be born they're no. they come to this world and it must be incredibly confusing when there isn't anybody to love them there's a lot of goodwill out there there's a lot of love out there and there is a lot of support but um, we need to structure that and and yeah, make a difference, even in a small, small way with this Christmas campaign. Um, the impact and effects of that can be huge and will be huge. Yeah. We all do it together. Yeah. Oh, thank you so, so much for um, sparing the time to have a chat. Absolute pleasure.